get into today's message. We are in week three of a series that we're doing called Ever Wonder Why, and we've been asking some really big questions in this series. So if you've missed the first two, maybe you want to go back and you want to look at those, but the first, I think the first week we asked the question, you know, why does God let bad things happen to good people? And then last week we talked about why does God let people go to hell when they die? And then this week we're talking about something that I think is really, really like pertinent and and important to many of us. And it's something that a lot of us maybe wonder about or we're curious about, but we're talking about prayer today. And specifically, the question that we're going to address today is, why did God not answer my prayer? So we've all had these prayers in our lives where we've we've prayed them, we've, we've wondered, like, why didn't God answer that? God answers some prayers, why doesn't He answer my prayer? And I just know that that many of us, if not all of us, have been in a position in one way or another, where you have asked the question, why did God not answer that prayer? Did he not know that I needed that? Did he not know that, that uh, this was so important to me? Am I not loved? Am I not cared for? Do my prayers not matter? Or, or is, maybe someone is in a, in a spot in their life where they're like, why is it even worth praying? Because it never seems to, to do anything different. It never seems to matter. And so I think it's important that we talk about that. And, and if you find yourself in that place, or you've ever found yourself in that place, then today we're going to answer this question of, why did God not answer my prayer? Now, to break down prayer a little bit, I, I first want to start with how powerful prayer is. Prayer is such a powerful thing. I mean, we, we all know the stories in the Bible that we've heard about. Just to give you a couple, um, you've got Joshua who prayed, and, and he actually asked God to make the sun stand still in the sky, and the sun stood still in the sky. And then there's a story of, of Elijah, and Elijah prayed to God, and Elijah was having this head-to-head battle with, uh, with another god or another group of people that were worshiping these other gods, this god of Baal. And there were 800 sort of false prophets of this god, and Elisha prayed that God would send fire down and set them all on fire, and, and he did, and God did that. And that, that was just this amazing, amazing thing. And then there, there's, there's situations in the Bible where people have prayed in faith and asked God for healing, and, and that has come. But there's these super powerful prayers. I mean, could you imagine being, I don't know if you all know the story of Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den. And, and Daniel, he's thrown into, into this den of lions, and these lions would have been starved methodically. So that when Daniel was put in there, they would have torn him to shreds and they would have eaten him. And Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and he prayed for protection and God protected him. It's like God does powerful things in prayer and through prayer. I know in my own personal life, Casey and I have witnessed God do some incredibly amazing things. There was a situation that I'll I'll share about us. Casey and I were in Swaziland. And we had gone to Swaziland for a little bit of a, of a vacation. We were at the time living in Nelsprit, and we went across the border into Swaziland. And on our way out of Swaziland, we get stopped at the border, and, and they actually tell, tell me, they say, because they, they knew me, I was going back and forth a lot, and they hand me Casey's passport, and they say, actually, Casey's passport is, is illegal. Her visa is not valid. And it's like, well, it is valid because we got in the country on this visa. And they say, I'm sorry, Chris, it's, it's illegal. So I said, well, what do we do? And they're like, well, you, you can't come into South Africa this way. You, you have to, maybe we can send your visa to Pretoria, and then you're stuck in Swaziland until it gets sorted. But Leafa was in South Africa. Anyway, it's a whole big mess. So we ended up getting the passport back and going backwards through, through the border, which is something you don't do if you've ever been through a border. They're meant to go one way and one way only. And so we just kind of hightailed it back into Swaziland. All the guards were like, you know, what is happening here? Because we just whizzed right by them. And so we went up into, way up into the mountains at, the, at, at another border post. And it was way, way, way far out. And on the way there, we're just praying and praying and praying. And Casey's messaging people and asking them to pray and asking them to just pray. Because we're just like, how do we get out of this country and get into South Africa? And, And finally, when we got to the border post about two hours later... We pull up to this sleepy little post, and, and there's, there's this noise off in the distance. And the, the, the noise that we could hear was like dirt bikes. We could hear the engines going. And we walked into the, the border, into the office. And when, when you do that, they scan your passport. And so they scan the passport and the visa. And if there's anything wrong, it flags on the system. 
And so while these guys are, are taking mine, and while they're taking Casey's, you could hear the dirt bikes going. And fortunately, and this is just God's providence, these guys were more concerned with what was happening in the dirt bikes. So I watched them, scan, I watched them watching the mountain scan, scan, scan. Okay, you guys can go through. Stamp, stamp. And we went through. But that was after two hours of us saying, God, can you do a powerful prayer? Can you please get us back into South Africa so that we can sort this, this thing with Casey's visa? Can you please sort it? And God did that. He answered that prayer. And so I know that in, in your life, there are some powerful moments. We've seen people healed of cancer. We've seen, we've seen God move in powerful ways. We really have. But th there's also this thing that, that is kind of it's hard to wrap our head around because Jesus makes this statement. And when we read this statement, it really influences the way that, that we interpret prayer. And see, in John 14, and, and this, is, this is a powerful statement of Jesus, but it also can lead to, to maybe us having a, a bit of a misunderstanding. But John 14, 13 through 14 says this. It says, whatever you ask in my name, so that's in the name of Jesus, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So if you ever... Notice that when I pray, I always end a prayer. I say, in Jesus' name, amen. Because that's me redirecting my heart and redirecting the prayer to say, I, I pray this in the power and the glory of Jesus. Not, not of my own desire, but hopefully of the heart of Jesus. But this verse here that Jesus is saying, it's easy for us to take this. See, I can kind of wrap my head around it a little bit more because this is what I do. I study these things and I understand these things. But for the average person reading this, it's like, okay, if I ask anything in Jesus' name, if I ask anything of him, then he'll do it. And what happens is this leads to prayer moving from something that can be very powerful to now all of a sudden prayer can be very confusing. Because we, we don't exactly know what, what is God going to answer and what is God not going to answer. We, we don't know when God is going to be powerful or when we're going to kind of be left wondering if God is going to answer a prayer or not answer a prayer. Because we read the verse that says, hey, Jesus says, whatever you ask for in my name, I will surely do it. So it's like, okay, in Jesus' name, can you please heal me from cancer? Can you please handle my anxiety? Or Jesus, can you please uh, come through with my kids because my kids are lost and I want, them to, I want them to come together and to know Jesus and to be rooted in something that's good for them. Don't let my kids be lost, Jesus. Surely you want that. Surely for me, you want my kids to be found. Surely you want my life to not be a mess. I mean, you love me. You sent God, you sent Jesus to die for me. So in Jesus' name, in your name, I'm praying for this. And so I, I want to ask you this question. I want you to think about this. But have you ever prayed for something that you knew and believed God could do, and yet he did not do it? So have you ever asked for something? Now, this isn't the, the, the crazy miracle. This is the thing that you're like, God, I know you can do this. I've seen you do this in other people. I know you can do this in my life. And you believe he could do it, and yet he didn't do it. See, what I'm hoping to do in this point of the message is I'm hoping to unify all of you out there. See, I, I hope that, that up to this point, you've got something in your mind where you're thinking, yeah, I have prayed that prayer. Yeah, I have wondered why God didn't answer this prayer in my life. Yes, I, I have been curious as to why sometimes God does something amazing for someone else, and he doesn't do anything for me. There was a time when, when Casey and I, we were going through about a vehicle every three months. And they just kept breaking down. We'd get another broken vehicle. It'd break down, get another broken vehicle. And I was praying, God, can't you just let us get one vehicle that just works? And as I'm praying, like, Lord, please let it work. And, and, and for some reason, I was in a Defender and a Land Rover, which I should have known better than to drive a Land Rover. And then pray and ask God for the miracle that it would work. But as I'm driving up a hill out of Nelsprit, and I'm watching my engine just overheat, and so I slow down, let it cool down, speed up, and it overheat. And as I'm praying, like, God, can't you just help me? I, I find out from a friend called and, and one of our ministry partners, uh, a, a local church kind of out in one of the townships, somebody bought him a brand new Hilux. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? This is not fair. Here I am in a vehicle that floods when it rains. Somehow water seeps up through the bottom, and it overheats. And it's like, God, 
Why, why can't you take care of me? I mean, here I am driving around. We're, we're working with all these people. Why can't you take care of me and Casey? Why do we just always have a broken vehicle? And then this other guy who doesn't deserve it, obviously, <laughs> gets a brand new Hilux. But this leads us to ask the question of, like, why did God not answer my prayer? Like, why is it that God didn't answer my prayer? And to understand more about how, how we're going to answer this question, to understand more about prayer, we, we first, and, and what I really want you to understand, and we're going to focus on this, is I want you to understand that, that the nature of God and the purpose of prayer. So it's, it's by the nature of God, what I mean is who are you talking to? Who is it that you're praying to? Who's the thing that's up above that you're saying, okay, God, please help with this, or God, please answer this prayer. What is the nature of, of him? What is the nature of, of the one that created you and that created the universe? And then what, what is, is, is the purpose of prayer? Like, why do we do that? Well, why is it that we talk to God? See, we need to understand what, what the answer to these things are before we can really start to understand maybe why God doesn't answer a prayer, why he answers some, but he doesn't answer others. And so when it comes to the nature of God, the nature of, of us and God, it's important for you to understand that, that we are not the main character. See, God is actually the main character. See, we, we put ourselves as the main character because we don't feel what God feels. We feel what, what we feel. We feel when it hurts to us, and we feel when, when we're sad. We feel when our prayers aren't being answered. We don't necessarily feel what God feels. And so we think, why, why is this happening to me? Why isn't God answering my prayer? Meanwhile, we've put ourselves as sort of the center of the universe and the center of the sun. And instead, it's, it's not us. It's God. God is the main character. God created this world. God created you. God sent his son to die for you. God is the one that orchestrates your life. God is the one that's in charge. There is nothing that is outside of God's will, not your will. See, God is the main character. God is the one that is at the center of everything, not us. Now, when we understand that, that's hard for us to, to wrap our head around and to understand. But, but by me saying I'm not the main character, it changes the way that I look at my relationship between me and God when I'm praying. See, God is the main character in my life. Not, not me, not Casey. And that's hard to remember when we pray. But the purpose of prayer, the purpose of prayer is this. It, it's not to get God to do our will but to know God so that we can do His will. That's why we pray. If you want the definition for why we pray, it's this here. But to know God so that we can do His will. See, see God desperately wants us to know Him. See, what we don't understand and what we don't take, we kind of take this for granted, how relational God is. How much God desires a relationship with you. How much God desires for you to know Him. You know, K K Casey and I, when, when we first got married, there was a, a really, really special time for us of, of getting like to know each other. And I started to realize that my wife has kind of a different uh, way of getting to know each other than, than I do. So for me, I can be in the same room as Casey, and that counts as quality time. So I could be watching TV, she could be reading a book. But we are in the same room, and therefore we are spending quality time together. That counts. That's filling the tank. That's filling the bucket for me. And it's, it's great. It's wonderful. I even told her the other night, I, I said, you know, I just, I, I'm look, I just want to sit in the same room as you while you're doing something else. And, and she's like, you know, thank you. That's so sweet. But, but like, I have a desire to be in the same room as her. But for Casey, the idea of getting to know, me getting to know her is, is talking is actually us having a conversation together. So when we first got married, it would be, it would be kind of funny because I would, I would be like, okay, we spent all day together. Like, we're done. It's time to go to bed and go to sleep. And she said, no, we haven't started yet. I'm like, what do you mean we haven't started? I spent four hours with you. She's like, no, we weren't engaging. But see, Casey had this desire for me to get to know her. And when I got to know her, I understood her. And I understood her love and her desire for me. And as I got to know her, I understood what she expected and she wanted from me. I got to know her and I got to, uh, the ability to understand the depths of, of her love for me. 
See, I got to understand the complexity that was her, the beautiful complexity that was my wife. But it took getting to know her. And see, God wants us to know Him. God wants us to fall in love with Him, to spend time with Him, to want to, to desire quality time with Him. See, this is the most important thing to understand today when it comes to prayer. Prayer is about a relationship with God. It's about you developing a relationship with Him. See, we like to put prayer into the category of... I'm actually, I've got a picture for you. This is the, the, the prayer Santa Claus. So what we like to do is we like to say, you know, this is what I would like. God, I would like for you to give me this and this, and I would like for you to give this other person the broken Hilux. I would like for you to, 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 to just kind of take care of my needs. Here's my wish list. And then what God does as the prayer of Santa Claus is God looks at us and he says, well, if you've been naughty, okay, if you've been naughty, I'm marking you off the list. Okay, if you've been nice, yes, I'll, I'll put you on the list. So now here we are. We're thinking, well, if God doesn't answer my prayers, then that means I've not earned the answer. I've not done something right. Or, wow, God did answer my prayer. That means that that's because I'm amazing. Or I did something great. Look at me. God answered my prayer. And so we've developed this false image of what prayer is and what prayer is like as far as being kind of like this, this, this prayer Santa Claus. Now, the, the other image of prayer that I want us to think about is, is this idea of prayer. It's, it's not like a drive through window, like at a, at a McDonald's. Th think, about, think about that. Think about there being, uh, when you drive up to McDonald's, you go through and as you go through the, the drive through you come up to the intercom. And then at the intercom, you know, they, they say something to you. Back in the old days, we would push a button at the intercom. And then you order what, what it is that you want. And it, it's fast. It's easy. It's quick. It doesn't take any commitment from you. It doesn't take, any, um, it, it doesn't take much of your time. And so we treat God kind of like this drive through Like, I'm just going to pull through real quick. And I'm going to get something that I need. Hey, I'm just going to pause my day real quick because I don't have time to go in and sit down. Or I don't have time to really commit to, to actually having a meal here. I just need to do this on my way as I'm going to the next thing. Because the point in the drive through is for you to get food in a way that conveniences you in the least way possible. And so the point with prayer is not for us to interact with God in a way that inconveniences you in the least way possible. That's, that's not why we pray. See, God is not just, just a button, a push button for us to, to get something for Him. God is actually a relationship for us to pursue. See, God wants us to pursue a relationship. God wants a relationship with you. See, th this prayer thing is all about you and Him having a relationship together. And so... Now that you know a little bit about the, the nature of God, Him being the main character, you know the purpose of prayer is for relationship. It's for you to get to know God, for you to get to know Him on an intimate level. We're still left with this question. See, I, we could end here and say, well, this is what, what the Bible says about prayer. And, and I hope that you just go, just keep talking to God. But, but as you sit there, and as at times in my life, as I've sat there, we're still left with the question, of why does God not answer my prayer? Even when we seem to get things right. Even when I sit down in the morning, so I get up in the morning, and I lay out my desk, and I get ready to have a quiet time, or I sit in a chair, and I say, okay, God, today I'm going to sit down and pray. And I've done this for three days in a row, and you've still not answered my prayer. Even when we seem to think that we've done everything right. God, I'm pursuing a relationship with you. You know, Lord, it would be really great if you would just take care of my kids who are just kind of wayward at school. But, okay, you know what? I'm just going to lay that out there for you. But I know it's not about me asking you for something. So I'm just going to, you know, worship you, Lord. You're God. You're the main character. But, oh, by the way, there's still this thing over here that really I'm concerned about. And we, we're still left wondering this. And so I, I want you to know, even after... You know why we pray, and even, though, even now after you know the nature of God and who we pray to, it's still okay for you to be left asking the question of why does God not answer all of our prayers, even when we seem to get things right? Now, today I'm going to give you four reasons. These aren't the only four reasons, but these are four big reasons as to why maybe God is not answering the prayers 
that you're praying in your life. And, and as you listen to these reasons, what, what I want you to do is I want you to try and think of them in, in a way that maybe God is inspiring you to connect with one of these things. So of the four things that, that we're going to put on the screen and talk about, these are not things to condemn you. These are not things for you to feel like, oh, well, I have that in my life, so I'm horrible. Yeah, God's never going to answer that in my life. No, no, no. These are four points where you can be encouraged to say, oh, you know what? Maybe this is happening in my life. Man, thank you, Lord, for bringing this to light. Now, I'm going to go deal with this thing. And then when I deal with this thing, wow, that's going to set me free from this. So, so that's how I want you to interpret these things. Can we do that? Can we, yes, fantastic. Okay. The first thing, the first reason why maybe God is, has not answered your prayer is that you have a broken relationship. So uh, again, I'll use an example of my wife and I. It, it is so hard for Casey and I to do ministry when our relationship is not good. In fact, if you've ever... Uh, if you are ever invited to our house and Casey and I are not good, I will not hesitate to cancel on you, even though you may be three minutes from our doorway. Because it just doesn't work. We just can't do ministry together if our relationship is not good. We, we, we barely can do breakfast together or the bedtime together if the relationship isn't good, let alone doing like ministry together. And when we're not good, when we pursue God, when I pursue God in prayer, when she does, it's just glaring like, I'm like, oh man, I know that things aren't, aren't right here. And see, if you have a broken relationship, it will get in the way of your prayers to God. And I'll show you this in Scripture. In, in Mark chapter 11, it, it says this, Therefore I tell you, so this is, this is Jesus talking, Everything you pray and ask for, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. So it's like, okay, everything you pray and ask for, believe it. It can be yours. This is great. Starting out really great. And then in the next verse, verse 25, it says, And whenever you stand praying, so it's like, okay, believe that everything can be yours that you pray for, but, 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 uh, one thing. And when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you of your wrongdoing. See, I think what God is trying to tell us here, what Jesus is telling us, is that our relationships with others are important to God. So our relationships with others are so very important to God. Your relationship with someone else matters to God. Your relationship with your husband, with your wife, with your friends, with people that you work with, matter to God. So we serve a highly, highly, highly relational God. So God, remember the purpose of prayer is that we get to know God so that we can do His will, so that we can know Him intimately. And because God is so relational with us, it just makes sense that God would want you to be relational with others, and He would want your relationship with others to, to be good and to do well. And so our relationships with others are so important to God. I'll give you another verse here in Matthew. It says this. So if you are offering your gift on the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Now, when they, when they offered gifts on the altar, it was like they went on a journey. It was an all-day thing. They got in line. They finally got up to the altar. They were going to sacrifice their dove or whatever it was that they were going to, they were going to give. And, and, and God is saying, hey, in that moment, after you've bought the, the sacrifice and spent time in line, in that exact moment, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, then here's what you do next. This is where God defines the priority for us. In verse 20, or he says in verse 24, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Forget it. Your sacrifice is not as important as the relationship that I want you to have with the people in your lives. Your sacrifice doesn't mean as much as how you, how you, how you have a relationship with others. So he says, first go and be reconciled with your brother or sister, then come and offer your gift. Then come and do it. See, God is relational. Now I've got one more verse. This one is specifically for, for the husbands out there, for, for the, the fathers, for the dads, for the husbands. In 1 Peter 3, 7, it says, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. 
See, again, God is incredibly relational. See, if you've got a prayer in your life that's not been answered, what I want you to take away from point number one is there is a tender, loving God who desires a relationship with you, and He desperately wants you to have a good relationship with others. That's what this is. It's about relationship. So if you've got a relationship in your life that's not good, then my prayer and hope for you this morning is that God tenderly puts that name on your heart. He tenderly puts that name on your tongue and on your lips. And and He draws in you a desire to reconcile so that you can grow closer in relationship with them and closer in relationship with God. Now the second reason that God may not be answering your prayers is that maybe you have the wrong motives. So growing up, I couldn't understand why God would not answer my prayers for my girlfriends to stop breaking up with me. <laughs> I just couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand, like, God, please don't let this happen. Please, you know, make her love me forever. We're going to get married. You know, every, every young person, you know, you meet somebody, you fall in, quote, unquote, you know, love. You, you know, you get the butterflies, and you're like, man, this is going to be it. God, let this just, let this be it. You know, and then it's not it, which, you know, praise God that God's in charge of that and not me. Um, but it, it's just a, kind of an interesting or funny way to think about like what your motives are. You know, sometimes your motive isn't great. Sometimes your motive is self-centered. Sometimes your motive kind of is, is, is self-centered and, and selfish. You, you may be praying something, but actually like your heart is, is looking for a specific thing. Your heart's looking for a specific motive. You know, like, like your heart is looking for to some kind of completeness. So often where this comes into play, often where we see this, is when your prayers start to reflect an emptiness or a hole in your heart that you're not letting Jesus fill, then you have to question your motives. And when I say selfish, I don't mean that in like a condemning way. I'm not here to condemn you this morning. A selfish prayer is a prayer that's just about you. Because you, you, you're, maybe you're hurting, or maybe you care about yourself. But when your prayers start to reflect a hole in your life, an unquenchable desire, a desire for meaning, a desire for completion, and that is not Jesus, then your motives are selfish. Your motives are not in line with, with Christ and with God. Now remember, the purpose of prayer is to get to know God and therefore do His will. Meaning you and God are in sync. You and God are together. It's relational. I keep saying that over and over. It's relational. And this, this here, this self-centered prayer, this selfish prayer, you have a relational God that is looking at you and saying, I can fill that hole for you. Hey, hey, you know what? You keep, you keep asking for this. I can fill that. I can, I can feel that and feel you. And I love you and I want to pour everything I am and I have into you. So don't pray for this thing here. Instead, get to know me. Get to know God. That, that's what this is here. If you find that, that this is you, if you've got a hole in your heart and you're praying and asking for something else to fill it, I want you to take away from this point that there is a tender, relational God that says, I will fill your hole abundantly and it will overflow. Now, I, don't we want that? that? I mean, it's hard to do, but, but that is the best thing for us. Now, the, the third reason that God may not be answering your prayer is that even though you pray, you don't believe that God will actually do it. So even though you say a prayer... You don't believe that God will actually do it. I'll, I'll tell you um, a, a story about myself. There have been many times where I've prayed prayers that I did not believe that God would, would actually answer. Uh, one time, my wife and I, we were just married, and we were living in White River, which is outside of Nelspreet. And as we would drive to the gym, or as Casey would drive to the gym, there was a house. And this house was a, a huge house. It was a five-bedroom house, three hectares of land, fruit trees, and all that stuff. And because it's in White River, it was like, you know, 8,000 rand a month to rent. I mean, it was nothing. And it was just this beautiful place. And Casey comes home one day, and she says, that's the house that we're going to live in. God's going to give us that house. And I'm like, okay, 
fine, you know? It's easy to support your wife when you're absolutely sure that it's not going to happen. It's like, you know, <laughs> hey, babe, knock it out, you know? Like, go for it. Like, you want to pray? Awesome, pray. And she challenged me. She said, hey, every morning when, when I go to the gym, I'm going to pray. And I said, okay, you know what? Fine. I'll pray as well. Every morning on the way to the gym, I would pray. And as I would say this prayer, I would also kind of subconsciously end with, well, because Casey wants it. Like, I didn't, I didn't believe. I, I, I didn't believe this, but you know what? My wife believed. And about three months later, we moved into that house. That house went from having someone getting ready to buy it to having someone approach us and say, do you want to rent this house? And, and see, my, my wife believed, but I, I didn't believe. And there's lots of prayers in my life that I've prayed where deep down inside, I said, I don't really believe. I don't really believe that God will do this. It's like, wh where is that in you? Wh what's coming from you that's fueling that? What is it in you that's fueling your disbelief? Is it because you've never seen God do it before? Is it because you don't believe that you're worth it? Is it because you don't believe that God loves you enough? Is it because you, you don't have any experience with God just doing anything powerful in your life? Like, what is it inside you that says, I would like to pray for this, but I don't believe that God will actually do this? See, when I prayed the prayer as I drove by the house every morning, I didn't believe because I thought, this is crazy. This is the real world. This isn't make-believe spirit land. This is the real world. Someone lives in that house. Someone, like, there's a family. There is zero indication that this house is going to change owners or be available for anyone uh, else to live in it. And so my disbelief came from a place of, like, I, God, I, I understand God working when it makes sense to me. But I don't understand God working when it only makes sense to him. And that's where my disbelief came from. And I've learned to stop looking for things to make sense to me, for them to work, and instead looking at God and saying, well, if it doesn't make sense to me, then it absolutely probably makes sense to God. And when something can only be done because God ordains it, then now you're in a place where you need to be. See, if your prayers are not impossible to you, then maybe they're a little bit offensive to God. See, if our prayers are not impossible to us, then that means that it can happen within our grasp. It can happen within, within our own doing and our own control. But when a prayer is completely impossible to you, and it can only happen through what God does or through, through God answering that prayer or moving that mountain, now you're finally in a place where God is ready to work and move in your life. Stop looking for God to answer a prayer in a way that it makes sense to you. That, that's where many of us hit this here. It's not because we don't believe in God, but it's because we have a hard time understanding that God can do something even though you can't see a way for God to do it. So I've got a verse here that I'll share for you in, in Mark. It says, Jesus asked, so to give you a little context behind this here, th this is a, a quick story. There, there was a, a, a boy that was possessed by demons. And the disciples tried to heal uh, this boy, they tried to basically cast the, the demons out. And if you read the New Testament, there's a lot in the New Testament about people being demon-possessed. And, and Jesus taught the disciples how to do that, how to free people who were, who were possessed by demons. It, it'd be kind of like maybe in our day, how to free somebody who's, who's possessed by like alcoholism or who has a bad habit or, or who has something that they can't get freedom from. It's like, we have things in our life that we want freedom from that we just can't seem to have. But th this in the, in the New Testament was like an extreme case. This thing had, had thrown the boy into the fire, had tried to kill the boy. And this dad had gone to the disciples and said, Can you please uh, heal my son and just cast this demon out of my son? And they tried and they couldn't do it. That They were unable to, to do it. And so the, the father, he comes to Jesus. And, and Jesus asked the boy's father, So how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. So he, Jesus, or the father gives Jesus this idea of this is what's happening here. And so Jesus says, or, or the guy says to, to Jesus, he says, But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. See, th this is a prayer that this guy doesn't believe can happen. Because he doesn't see a way for it to happen. So he actually says... But if you can, 
That's a really soft way of saying, God, I need a miracle in my life, but if you can, or maybe if you can, or if one of your friends comes to you and says, I'm sick, can you pray over me because I, I feel sick, and, and your small group gets together, and as your small group gets together to pray over somebody that's sick, you're praying, and then, but in your mind, you're kind of saying like, okay, Lord, heal my friend, heal Susie if it's your will. If it's in your will, if you want to do that, but if you can, it's kind of like giving yourself a, a way out, a way to say, well, okay, this, uh, this doesn't really, you know, uh, it doesn't really, yeah, there's a way out of this. I can explain this away from Jesus, but if you can, take pity on us. And then Jesus responds in the next verse. He says, if you can, said Jesus, Jesus is like, if you can, haven't you seen what I've done? Haven't you seen everything that I've done? Haven't you witnessed the miracles that I've, that I've done? Everything is possible for the one who believes. Everything is possible. And so immediately the boy's father ex- ex- exclaimed, I do believe and help me overcome my unbelief. See, your faith matters to God. Your faith matters extremely to God. And, and Jesus says to so many people in the New Testament, it's your faith that has healed you. When a woman who had been bleeding for for 12 years came to Jesus, she just touched his robe, and Jesus turned around as he felt the power releasing from him, and he said, your faith has healed you. The the blind man that, that that, that approached Jesus and said, Jesus, can you heal me? And Jesus turned to him and said, you know, do you, what can I do for you? He actually asked the man, what can I do for you? And the man says, I want you to heal me. And Jesus says, it's your faith that you have been healed by. See, your faith matters so much to God. And it's so wonderful because even if you don't have faith, you can pray this honest prayer like the father did that said, Jesus, help my unbelief. You can help me. Lord, I'm coming to you if you can do this, but help my unbelief. You know why we can be so honest with God? Because he's a relational God. Because he actually cares about you. Because he, he, he wants you to be real with him so that he can be real with you. Jesus is a relational father. So you can be honest with him. And now the, the last reason, and, and this is maybe the hardest reason, is maybe God has something different. So maybe God's got something different than what you're praying for. And that's a hard one to wrap our head around. It really is. Is that you may be praying for something so desperately, and yet God may have something completely different in mind for you. So I'm going to tell you one story about, uh, about me and about Casey when we moved to Cape Town. And then after that, we're going to go into a, a, a last time of worship, and then we'll be done here. But when Casey and I moved to Cape Town, we didn't come to Cape Town to lead South Point Church. We came to Cape Town to start like our own church, start a new church, which we felt like God was calling us to do. And for three years, we tried to start a church in Cape Town. For three years, I would pray, God, you called us here to this city, and yet nothing is happening. Casey and I were always people that could attract people and lead things and do things. And three years after trying to start a church, we had one family that was coming and meeting with us on a Sunday night. One family. Now in that season, I had such a a bad time with anxiety and depression. And there were times when when I laid in the bathtub, I would put my head under water to try and drown out the outside world because I was consumed with anxiety and depression. And I would just say, God, why, why are you not answering my prayer? Why are you not taking care of me? Why are you not helping? And see, what I couldn't hear is I couldn't hear God saying, Chris, I've got something different for you. I've got something better for you. And see, that three-year season of, of, of stress and anxiety and depression, it fundamentally changed me. It changed my DNA. It changed who I am completely. And then we were given the opportunity to volunteer here. And then we were given the opportunity to take over leading South Point Church as the lead pastors. But but if God had done what I had asked for, then Casey and I would not be here. See, praise the Lord that sometimes God has something different for you. Praise God that he had something different for us. You know, praise God for those moments in the bathtub where I would put my head under water and try and drown out everything. Praise God for those moments when all I could do is just lay in bed and wonder, God, why aren't you working? Why aren't you working in us? Praise God for all the anxiety and all the depression and all of those things that you would think, why is he praising God for that? Yes, it was hard, but you know what? God made me different because he had something different for us. And so whatever prayer you're praying that you're dealing with, 
whatever it is that you're struggling with in your life, is there possibly something different that God has for you that you don't see? It's easy to look back and say, I'm so glad that God didn't stop pursuing me. I'm so glad God had something different for me. But in your moment now of hurt, of pain, in your moment now, what happens if you say, God, what if I let go of what I'm asking for and I just give you freedom to do something different in me? And so it, it's fitting, since we're talking about prayer today, we're actually going to have a chance for you guys to respond in prayer. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to call up, um, we've got a, a new team of people. These are people that are set aside, that have volunteered because they want to pray with you and they want to pray for you. They care about you and they're going to be down here in the corners. And just like we do every week, you know, we, we end with, with one more song. And the reason that we end with this song is when you walk out those doors, life gets crazy. And, and when life gets crazy, you forget everything in here. I do the same thing. You walk through that door, it's a portal. As soon as you cross under the doorway, the kids are there and family's there and everybody's there and everything in, that God's doing in this moment in this room just drops away and then that's okay. So I wanna give you a moment here to respond. Hang in here for this song and respond in this moment. And so you can respond in a couple ways. When the band starts singing after I pray, you can come down front for prayer. And maybe one of these four things has resonated with you. And you can come down and say, hey, I, I'm struggling with number one, or I'm struggling with number two, or number three, number four, whatever it is. Can you just pray with me? And our volunteers will just pray and encourage you. And then the other reason you can come down is if you need prayer for anything in your life, anything at all, even if you want to pray for, if you've got a sick dog, or you want to pray uh, for a, a praise celebration, or whatever it is, you can come down and pray with somebody about that. We're, we as a church are going to stop doing life alone. And we're going to stop being alone in life. And the way that we do that is we invite others in and we open ourselves up to others. And so we're, we're going to give you guys the opportunity for that today. So I'm going to pray for us. And then after I pray, we'll, we'll jump into one last song of worship. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you move throughout this room. I pray that you speak to anyone that has...